Do you have the personality traits to be an entrepreneur? This is the focus group. It's the savvy side of nine to five. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. <laughs> And learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is The Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S-T-A-U-N-C-H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, Mr. John T. Nash. We're in the middle of February. We're on to, we're on to Valentine's Day almost, John. Do you, are you, do you have any Valentine's Day? February 12th. Wednesday. Do you have anything going on for no. Valentine's Day? For no, 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 not not for years and years and years. We okay. we got off no of Valentine's. No, you know, it, love hearts. When when we were when Bob and I were first seeing each other, yes, there was a dinner or something fun or special. But shortly after that, it's like, do you really want to do this? <laughs> so it was decided. Do you guys do Valentine's Day? <sighs> Ah, <laughs> did you hear that song? Yeah. Yeah. Boys in the Must booth. be great to be gay. <laughs> <laughs> well, doesn't your lady expect something? I that's why. Does. That's why he just said. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. What does she want? That's and her fair. birthday is two days before Valentine's oh, Day. Oh, double whammy, double whammy. So it's impossible to get any reservations because usually people fill yeah. up the weekend before Valentine's Day, and that's usually her birthday. And then, yeah. So does that mean she's an Aquarius? Yes, I, don't, I have no idea. Yes, yeah, well, it could <laughs> be. February twelfth. Yeah, it could be an Aquarius. That's a good sign. I mean, she's even keeled and fun, good energy. Steve, do you have huh. someone special huh. in your life? I do not know. Oh, so Excuse you're open. me. Well, there's Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we sit around and eat chocolates and masturbate together, but that's different. <laughs> Garrett, your comedic time. And excuse me. Perfect as always. Is that is that Robbie Bobby? It's Robbie back? Bobby back there. Do you have someone special, Robbie Bobby? No, I don't. Oh well, then see, Steve, you got options. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're setting your uh, matchmaker. <laughs> I only have two onesies, by the way. We keep threatening we're going to show these. You guys are going to put them on. <laughs> Robbie, Bobby, we'll have to get you something else from the International Mail Collection to try on if you're here to, uh, to do for the show. So, hey, thanks for joining us here every Wednesday at 1 p.m. East. But we know most of you time shift, so thank you for watching anyway. And be sure to catch our podcast, which is TFG Unbuttoned, released every Tuesday morning. Find out everything at focusgroupradio.com. So I believe that awards season is now officially over because we had the Academy Awards this past Sunday. Did you see any of the movies? And and we were talking about this. The the short answer is yeah, I've seen one or two, but the vast majority no. And that used to be a big thing of mine when I was younger was seeing all the yeah. best picture nominees or some of the other ones for like best supporting actor, best actor, best actress. And this goes back to the Super Bowl too like these events, are they really events anymore? I mean, there's so much controversy, like the Oscars. People were complaining that, again, it wasn't diverse, not enough female directors, not enough um, minority representation. And it's all, like, done beforehand. So by the time the ceremony happens, you've heard all this stuff. You watch it with a critical eye. And I, I don't know. What's the famous Martin Luther King quote? Content of my character versus what was... I only know the one about the arc of justice. <laughs> Everybody keeps talking about it. Bends towards freedom or something yeah. like that. So, hey, we want to, uh, as many of you know, watch the show. We like, uh, we love our sponsors. We want to talk to you about a newer sponsor or a newest sponsor we have called Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. -R. And uh, lots of times when you're looking for freelance talent, if you're a business or you have a project you're working on, we get the question all the time, where do you go? What do you do? Well, we go to Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. And uh, it's a great place to go if you're looking for freelancers and, uh, or someone to handle a project for you. They do all kinds of services, and they connect you with freelancers that do things like uh, graphic design, copywriting, web programming, film editing, uh, voiceover, logo creation, and so much more. And uh, we're actually using them, aren't we, John? We have a couple projects in process with Fiverr. So we're going to post the results, I think, next week on Facebook when I get them back. I'm working with three designers that I chose at three slightly different price points to redesign our Triberry Productions logo. We also have a client who I'm working with who's having their logo done by an artist from Fiverr. And that one's a fun one. I hope that I'll be able to show that if it comes out the way I want. But I'm going to give you a little focus group tip for working with Fiverr. Tim laid it out perfectly. It's a really cool site 
to figure out um, talent that you can work with for a lot of the things that Tim mentioned. I'll even throw in their motion graphics um, and some special effects work because uh, there's people that do that as well. And, and they have, the, and Tim mentioned web programming, but web design is a big key thing as well. Um, our little tip for you is two or three sentence paragraph. We call it a creative brief. If you have examples of things you like, you don't want your, maybe you don't want your logo to look like that, or maybe it's a, a, a website you're designing. Always give an artist examples of where your head is at and where your taste is at and what you're thinking of in, in the written word. Send that off. It's going to make it a much, much, much smoother process. And I think you'll find that with Fiverr, you'll end up developing some relationships with these artists that you use. You can go back to them again and again. They know how you work. Uh, they know your, your style. So it's a great site. And uh, if you use Fiverr and you've been directed there by the focus group, by all means, use focus in your first order, and you're going to get 10% off the cost of the order. So focus group tip, do a, little, do a little creative brief. Give them some examples of your thinking and your style that's going to make it take off. And visit Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R dot com, and use focus to get 10% off your first order. Perfect. <laughs> you know what else I like, too? If you have a deadline or something, you can search by deadline. Or you can oh. search by price, so you know right up front what's what's what, so you don't have to... That's searching by deadline. That's critical, man. Yeah. Because if you find someone who could do it in two days, it may not... Hey, it's, it's done, right? I remember I had a... Yeah. No, I, I'll, that'd be a story for another time, but <laughs> deadlines are important. So thanks to Fiverr. Uh, so, Mr. Nash, uh, what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Well, you know, I'm a cyclist. Uh -oh. All that means is I like to bike ride. And uh, here's a term. Have I ever taught you the term Fred? Fred? So in cycling, there's a website called uh, Velominati, and it's the rules of cycling. I don't know who created this, but it's all about how you're supposed to dress, how you carry your spare tube with you. It's like Velo News? Velo, yeah, Velo Manati. Yeah, exactly. V E L O Manati, M A N. M -A -N uh, Glitterati. Exactly. How you, uh, when you're riding, there's something called half wheeling. So if you're riding side by side with somebody and you're constantly a little bit ahead of them, you're half wheeling, and that's rude. That's how you walk. You're supposed to be side by side. <laughs> that's how I, I'm a half wheeler. Yeah, you're a half wheeler when you walk. <laughs> so one day, we're riding, you know, I'm riding with my friend Adam, who at the time was on a team, and he was wearing the team kit. So the, the shorts and the shirt are it's called the jersey the kit. for the, those of you that don't jersey know. Jersey and the shorts of the kit. And uh, we were talking about the Velominati rules, and I learned a phrase that I was, I was Fred. I will forever be a Fred. Fred. Anybody who's not on a pro team and not allowed to wear a kit, you know, a team kit, that's Fred. Fred's like the Sunday biker whose flat tire, you know, has a flat every time, whatever. So anyway. This I'm an amateur cyclist. I'm an amateur cyclist. This Fred found this story to be fascinating. Bike tour with disgraced Lance Armstrong will cost you 30 k I didn't think he was allowed to ride anymore. No, he can do private things. So Lance Armstrong wants you to ride with him, so long as you have the mighty big bank account needed to do so. The disgraced, I love the, uh, the author of this piece clearly had an angle. This disgraced cyclist. Where did it come from? Do you remember? <laughs> the New York Post. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> this disgraced cyclist and Out There Travel are partnering to charge potential riders 30000 to go on a bicycle tour with Armstrong and former teammate. You recognize the name George Hincappy? Oh, yes, George. In September, labeled the Move Mallorca 2020, according to the company's website. There are 12 open spots, and the money also goes towards accommodations, meals, bikes, and support as riders travel for five days and six nights across the Spanish island. Now, sidebar, the company also runs longer tours in Mallorca, Italy, and the Dolomite Mountain Range with Armstrong, and those cost, without Armstrong, sorry, and those cost $42.50. So you could ride with Lance for thirty k. You could ride the island for forty-two fifty. I did it for cheaper, by the way. When I did Mallorca, it was fifteen hundred for the seven days plus the train. Is he going to interact with you because you ride with him? You're you're with him, yeah. Yeah, but having known him, he's not the most personable person. So here's how the author concludes this piece: Armstrong was stripped of his seven <laughs> his seven Tour de France titles and is banned for life from the sport for doping. Hincapi also confessed to doping. Oh, he did? I didn't realize George did. And then they conclude with this. Armstrong has since had to pay up for lawsuits and settlements. In a 2018 interview with CNBC, he estimated the cost to him was $111 million, But he made an early investment in Uber, which 
basically saved his family, and now he's worth something like three he's billion. Worth a lot he's more. worth a lot of money. Was he worth lots a of money? Supposedly, the investment that he made in Uber, big big thing. Wow. So, on our old platform, one day Tim calls me up and he says, "Hey." We had a we had a publisher or a publicist who would send us the authors that were coming through Sirius, and George Hincapie was gonna and he said, hey, let's try to get George Hincapie. The interview started to go along. We're gonna get it. We're gonna get. It. Then they then they asked, what is the focus group? What do you guys do? They hear it's a, a show about business and marketing and about me and Tim and it's on OutQ, the LGBTQ channel. Radio silence. So here I was all getting ready to meet a, a hero of mine, even though he was accused of doping, and he did confess to, to it, and he got off and, with a minor slap on the wrist. Well, he was a homophobe, or is, because he, he uh, you know, we had a billboard that you designed that we had in Philadelphia with... You're talking about Armstrong or Hank Armstrong. Cappy, yeah. And we had him and Martina on the board together Champions. because Martina had just won Wimbledon for her millionth time, and Lance had won his fifth race or whatever. And they went ballistic that we placed him with her. We also were going to do that Trading Spaces show. They were each going to do a sp- yeah. for each other. And, and we were trying to have them work together. And uh, she was all for it. He wanted nothing to do with it because it would ruin his image. And uh, so you reap what you sow. You know, you told me that. I, I remember the day you called me, actually, because it was a huge side of the oh building. Oh, my God, it was an enormous, I think enormous. that one was on the left, one was on the right, right, and the Impreza or the WRX was in the middle. It was a, one of the sedans, and it was all about performance or right. something, and she was, in fact, the Grand Slam title she holder. She just won doubles in, in Wimbledon when at 40 Best something athlete of the last century yeah. I don't even think you could argue the stats on that. And then you call me up, you're like, yeah, you're going to love this one. And you ran through it. I was shocked, actually, because you're, they're both, anyway. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, if you want to ride with, we boy, we, we're selling that tour, aren't we? Yeah, take a ride with Lance. <laughs> if, you, if you dare. <laughs> there, you know, I had to laugh because you said it was the New York Post. Yes. It was a headline somebody posted the other day. I guess they're famous for their headlines. They are. This one was great. It was... Uh, Underwear bandit leave, leads police on brief chase. <laughs> Which I thought was quite funny. No one will ever, ever beat. Headless man found in topless, topless bar. bar. Yeah. <laughs> and that, I think, was a post line. So. Well, mine is quite different, but, you know, I love geography. So uh, we all, Brexit has been in the news, right? Britain has left the EU. Well, now the state of Virginia, many, many people in the state of Virginia are unhappy with what's happened to the state, and they're starting something called Vexit. <laughs> so Jerry Falwell Jr. and the West Virginia governor, Governor Justice in West Virginia, is very upset that the Democrats have taken control of the Virginia State House, and for the first time in generations, they've pledged to enact gun control measures, roll back abortion restrictions, and prohibit discrimination against LGBTQ people. So the governor of West Virginia is inviting counties from Virginia that aren't happy with what's happening to Virginia to join West Virginia. Because why not go to a state that's full of poverty and despair? I I just, before you continue, uh, the idea of a commonwealth, Mm -hmm. when all the counties band together and say, this is our geographic boundary, we are the state of Virginia. There, there was never an exit clause in being a state or a commonwealth. It was never even thought of, right? Well, so I didn't realize this. So the state of West Virginia actually was carved out during the Civil War. Um, oh, so it was not. So it became a, it became a union own. state. Okay. It became a union. So they broke off. And I also didn't realize, so did Kentucky. So the, initial, the original state of Virginia included what is now West Virginia and Kentucky, and they broke off. And there's some archaic... Uh, amendment or something still on the books from 18, because they cited it here, I believe it's 1858, that still, <laughs> they said still valid, that um, West Virginia is from 1863, they still have a valid proposal out to anybody who wants to join the state of West Virginia from Virginia to become part with no problem. You just have to get a petition, then it has to go through the state assembly and they approve you. And, well, uh, that. But by the way, that those little steps could take you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> at the time, West Virginia had 50 counties, and then by the time they finished it all out with uh, with West Virginia, West Virginia then became 
55 counties after they invited more in back uh, during Lincoln's time. It was a real mess within the Supreme Court and everything else that was going on. But I, I laugh because essentially they're just upset uh, that, um, that Virginia's become more blue. And then Falwell has actually said he's so upset they had this gun rally a few weeks ago, remember? At the Capitol, in, in State Virginia. Capitol, yeah. And Falwell said he would support civil disobedience if this gun law legislation passes. And uh, he says this is not a joke. And, uh, and same, with, uh, same with Governor Justice. And then <laughs> one of my favorite lines is someone said, you should, the governor of West Virginia should concentrate on all the poverty in his state rather than worried about screwing around with Virginia. <laughs> How so Vexit, V-E-X-I-T. Now, you know, this has happened, I guess, before. There was, there was talk at one time of, I believe Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard back in the day were very upset with Massachusetts. And Connecticut said, come on board. I, I, you know, I was just going to say, it's either Rhode Island or Connecticut's going to say, we'll take it. We'll take it. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so that's, uh, that was all stirred up. It, it, it'll go nowhere. They, they were talking to Virginia legislature, uh, legislatures and that were both Democrats and Republicans, and they were both saying, this is just a clown show. I, I, it just sounds like a complete waste of yeah. breath and time, right? They've had press conferences. If you Google it, it's all over. It's all over the place about them, them trying to do this. But really, it just boils down to the fact that they don't like that they're, the Democrats won in 2018. And there are a bunch of procrastinators that don't like uh, getting stuff done because getting stuff done, the hard work of finding consensus on public policy takes a lot longer than doing a press conference about seceding from Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> right. So business birthday today. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So our actual business birthday this week is February 13th, which is Thursday. But uh, so Samuel Blank, or Blanc, Samuel Blank was born uh, February 13th, 1883. He died December 20th in 1964 at 81 years old of heart failure. He was the founder of Roto-Rooter. You ever use Roto-Rooter? Yeah, who, who, who has not heard their... Famous jingle. What's yeah. the famous jingle? It's up there if you're watching on the video. Da, 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 oh, Roto-Rooter, da, da, da. that's the name and the way those goes troubles down, down the drain. drain. Wow, we have been so thoroughly programmed by television because that's where we get it from. <laughs> so he grew I should not have known that. I, why do I have that in my head, right? He was born in Wisconsin. At 10 years old, his father committed suicide. So he had to quit school to help his mom put food on the table. He worked as a lumberjack, a telephone lineman, and a salesman. He also took a correspondence course, they said luckily, fortuitously, in mechanical engineering. When he was well into his 40s, his grown son had offered him an unexpected twist. The kitchen sink in his son's apartment was clogged, and father and son could not afford a plumber, so they worked for most of the afternoon trying to use a plunger and a flexible length of cable to extract potato peelings from the pipes. It was a chore that left the older blank physically exhausted and frustrated, so he began drawing up plans for a device to make for unclogging pipes. And then he converted that to paper. Six years later, he started these machines called rotor rooters. He used old parts from a washing machine with an old coil, uh, coil wire at the end and started on clogging drains. It said that um, he pirated, most of, again, most of the parts from his wife's washing machine. When he unclogged his first pipe, he was delighted. His wife came up with the name roto Rooter. because really what was clogged were roots, tree roots that had grown into the pipes. So rooter. Take the roots out. So the Roto Round Rooter. He started making the machines. They originally cost $250, which was a hefty price during the Great Depression. But he went to market and um, it was a huge success, of course. The famous jingle, which we just sang, was done in 1954, still used today. And uh, it's one of the oldest famous jingles or one of the oldest advertising jingles in existence. Um, Rotor Rooter now, of course, is a huge company. It's been franchised. It's been it's sold in 2019, um, based out of based out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, but a company called Chemd Corporation employs thousands and thousands of plumbers. Over the years, they tried to get them to do other stuff, but he just wanted to do unclogging of drains. He knew what he was. No, he didn't want to do all this other. Do you agree with that? Stuff. I do. I, I, I'm, I'm you, glad you said that. At. You, you know, master of your trade. It says, uh, currently, Roto-Rooter remains the largest provider of plumbing repair 
and uh, and sewer drain cleaning. After he died, his family in 1980 sold off the sold off the business of Rotor Rooter, as I said, to Chem ChemCorp. And uh, so, yeah. So the thing about Roto Rooter that I'm a I, I've never known the origin story. So how cool was it that it was a real life problem? He was tackling it with his son. It was potato peels. The other thing about Roto Rooter that I find fascinating, and I, and this is they used to do this as part of their advertising work many years ago. No chemicals. It's a device. Yep. They put that snake thing down, and it it scrapes the pipe clean. But there's no abrasive chemicals. Nothing to destroy the the pipe. And I think that uh, sticking to that one thing is amazing. And well, they did say that he so he moved into after doing um, residential, they moved into commercial. They did they did do a branded. I believe there was almost like a Drano or something. There was a Rotor Rooter that you could buy, product yeah, you approved could buy. by. But, but they said that they did they did try um, over the years. So many people tried to get them to go beyond to actually and put plumbing in or install plumbing. They're like, no, we just want to fix, fix what's it. already installed. <laughs> I love that. Happy birthday, Samuel Blanc. Blanc. Hey, many of you know that uh, Deep Discounts are friends of ours here at uh, at the Focus Group, and we encourage you all to go to focusgroupradio.com. Click on the Deep Discount logo. Sharky the Shark's there. He'll be back. Arr, the shark is The water back. gets a little warmer. Sharky the Shark will be back. Okay, I'm, work, I'm working on a new puppet. Coming in the spring. Working on a coming new puppet. Spring. You're going to give a new puppet? I think, you know, you know what would be really good? I want a marionette. I want a marionette shark, but that, that's really pushing, yeah. the, pushing well, it. This week, we've got sights and sounds of the late 60s. There's a sale going on. So, John, what did you, what did you pick this This week? was a bonanza. This is a bonanza. I was just going to say, it took, so, I, you get on the weeds quick. If you go into uh, the deep discount sights and sounds of the 60s, um, you're going to get tons of television it's all the shows we grew up with that were made in that time so i did what tim does and that's where i go down to um page like six or 12 or 15 deep and then i did i still saw stuff like i saw carol burnett mary T like i'm like i should pick any one of these but then i thought i'm going to search for michael kane sir michael uh -oh. kane one of my favorite actors and uh so up comes a movie that I have heard about but never seen. It's called The Billion Dollar Brain on DVD. It's it's a comedy, and it's a secret agent spoof comedy. So Michael Caine plays this, this agent called Harry Palmer, and he's blackmailed into working for MI5 again on his wildest and most dangerous assignment yet. And in, here's one. An insane oil baron intent on destroying communism by starting a new world war is close to achieving his goal with the help of the world's largest and most powerful computer, hence the billion dollar brain. Hilarity ensues, but it, it's, it's tongue in cheek. There's, and in fact, someone said there's even, a reviewer said there's not, it's worth, it's worth a warning. It's not even trying to have the viewer suspend disbelief. This is hilarious from start to finish. Very entertaining in spots. And this one guy says, Donald Sutherland plays the voice of the brain, this room-sized computer. And as he goes, it's a great look back at a room-sized <laughs> computer with the reel-to-reels and punch cards. Remember them? Three plus three. Woo! <laughs> Six. <laughs> so this is one reason to, to visit Deep Discount. Go to focusgroupradio.com, click on their logo, as Tim said. You find stuff like this. I would... I would not see this on broadcast. Maybe it's been on broadcast TV. No, I don't think so. I never even heard of it. It's the billion dollar brain. What did you pick? I picked um, Close to You, Remembering the Carpenters, which is, wow. a, which is a, a fascinating look at one of the most unforgettable groups of the 70s and uh, late 60s, early 70s. So you'll see Richard and Karen Carpenter performing lots of their classic songs, plus rare archival footage and tributes by Herb Albert, uh, Les Paul, Burt Bacharach, and more. It also has exclusive footage not seen on other broadcasts. So if you're a fan of The Carpenters, which I believe... And a lot of TV appearances and stuff, right? Yeah, and they did a PBS special. And I do believe that Karen Carpenter's, the anniversary of her death was a couple weeks ago. 43 years ago, I think it was now. Yeah. Could be, that's yeah. Math is wrong. No, no, it's been a while. But uh, this was released uh, in 1998, the and then the original year that it came out was 1997. It's 100 minutes. It's under $20. You get it on DVD for $18.63. On uh, the DVD, close to you, remembering the Carpenters. Which are you a Carpenters fan? Oh, oh, yes. 
<laughs> and where, where, where were we recently where someone was, they were interviewing someone and she was asking about her favorite, like what was her favorite music? And the woman unhesitatingly said, I, I'd love listening to the voice of Karen Carpenter. Oh. And I guess it's a certain age for what, that, What was right? the, what was the I release? Forget, it was a sh oh, release this week. Uh, let me get to the release this week is Roma. Now, this is a movie that I did want to see. It was a lot of controversy around it. It's available on Blu-ray, and it's the uh, the eighth film of Alfonso Cuaron, uh, who's recreating his early 70s childhood in Mexico City, and it narrates a tumultuous period in the life of a middle-class family through the experiences of Cleo, the indigenous domestic worker who keeps the household running. So, do you remember when this came out? And by the way, it's released by the Criterion Collection, which means it's a they, they're going to take great care of the print. Seal of approval. It's going to be beautiful. There'll be lots of great extras on there, a lot of uh, voiceover commentary from the directors and actor, director and actors. Um, but they, a lot of people claimed when this came out, there was some controversy about the depiction of immigrants and of, of, of uh, certain people, of indigenous peoples. But I think it's worth a worth a viewing. I, I did not get to see it in the movie theater, and that's why I will probably be ordering it from uh, Deep Discount. Cool. All right, so uh, go to focusgroupradio.com, find the Deep Discount logo. Arr, it's Sharky the Shark. Click on that and begin your savings. Uh, we went over some stuff that was on sale. It's the 60s sale, and I picked something called The Billion Dollar Brain with Michael Caine and Donald Sutherland, and also Carl Malden, I think. Tim picked a, a retrospective of the... Uh, Close to you, remembering the Carpenters. And, that, and you know, the Carpenters spanned mid-60s into the 70s, Carpenters. right? And the release this week is Roma on Blu-ray. We are going to take a super quick break, and when we return, we will be back with some shop talk, so stay with us. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. <laughs> That's still my, one of my favorite openings. Just do it. Do it. Do it. Hey, hey welcome you know, to the movie. You know, yeah, well, fa what faster pussycat kill kill, right? You know, we watched uh, for the second time, and it really, and this should be part of the deep discount thing, but uh, Endless Summer. Oh, gosh. And you know, you do have to see the movies in sequence. You have to see the original Mizell Grey Gardens. You have to see the second version that the Mizells did that had the extra footage. Then you have to see Endless Summer. This summer. This, it, this summer. Yeah, the, yeah. Isn't it called This Summer? Yeah, I think it is This it Summer. Endless Summer, I think, was a love story. <laughs> All right, what's our shop so talk? It's the third, third in the Grey Garden series. series. <laughs> Of the trilogy. So, hey, yeah, we've got, uh, welcome back to the Focus Group. We've got uh, two shop talks here. The first one is um, an interesting read, and uh, we'll give you our, our thought on it. But it <laughs> oh, well, an interesting read. John picked it. John picked all of them. I'm, I'm hoping they're all better than interesting. <laughs> you possess the personality traits of a diehard entrepreneur. A decade of research will tell you. So the researchers agree that there's certain personality types, and uh, they usually have these seven qualities in common for people that are entrepreneurs. I didn't realize this. They said there's over 30 million small businesses in the U.S. Yeah. That's a lot. It's the engine of the economy whenever they claim how small business, how's Main Street doing? Right. It says the economy relies heavily on these businesses of which John and I are with Triberry Productions. We've got to do a commercial. Well, did you, um, so I've been doing my own stuff since I was 25 or 26 when I opened my first agency. Um, yeah, so you've been an entrepreneur for a long time. And I read these and I kind of enjoyed them. So the, Would you call yourself an entrepreneur? Yeah, yeah, I definitely would. Although I don't agree with every one of these traits. But well, let's, I, go, let's go through the seven. So what's the first one? First one is open to experience. And basically, are you attracted to continually changing environments and the novelty of new challenges? If so, you are likely more open to experience than the general population. So... The part that I didn't agree with is me personally. I don't like change. <laughs> Changing my environment a lot is not my optimal thing. But I do like new challenges and pu pu puzzles to solve. So I would say open to experience does apply to me, just not the way they... I was going to say you like to travel. That's true, yeah, yeah. Number two was you're less neurotic than the general public. 
and uh, meaning that you have some ex you have exceptional self confidence and the ability to take risks for starting a venture. I think that's self explanatory. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I'd have called it neurotic. But. Uh, yeah, and then they also claim in this thing that. Um, since most business owners hold the position of CEO naturally, because that's what they're doing, uh, they don't need to be concerned with pleasing their boss. So apparently neuroses pop up when you're trying to please someone. Yeah, so in the you're, you're anticipating what's yeah, the command means. shame. What was number three? Um, a high degree of self-efficacy. And they describe it like this. Do you believe in your capacity to do what it takes to achieve whatever it takes to succeed? This personality trait reflects confidence in your ability to exert control over your motivation, behavior, and social environment. This is where that determination and grit shines through. So self-efficacy means you're sitting in front of a client and they say, can you do this? And by the way, this has happened to me a lot. And you're in front of the client, so what do you say? Of course. Of course I can do that. <laughs> And then you get it done. You figure out how to get it done. So I like that one. Number four, I thought this was a typo. Internal versus external locus of control. <laughs> what part did you think was the typo? I locus of control? Locus of control I thought was an odd, an odd way of saying it. But essentially they were talking about whether you control your fate or you allow others fate. to control your yeah. fate. And uh, obviously entrepreneurs control their fate. Yeah, in fact, the, the shading there was interesting because an entrepreneur will look at a problem and say, Okay, it's a problem. I, I'm going to solve it. Others look at it and say someone did this right. to me, or and play the victim. In fact, did they? I think they used yeah. Don't play, yeah. they even say don't play the victim? Uh, another trait of of entrepreneurs and successful ones is a high level of conscientiousness, and this is a correlation between diligence and long term venture survival. I had to puzzle about that. A conscientious entrepreneur is goal directed, hardworking, and usually organized, open to experience, has emotional stability, and is often an extrovert. Um I was I read that I thought I wonder if Tim's gonna say anything about that. <laughs> well, I think you fit one or two of those. <laughs> Which ones do you think? Well, you're certainly an extrovert. Mm -hmm. The openness to experience. Now, you said earlier you weren't, but I well, think change, like changing environment. Right. You know, like let's move this here. Let's... I thought this one was odd because it seemed to be a catch-all for the the f first four. Yeah. This fifth one. You, in other words, you're saying you could have all just dumped that yeah. into this. Yeah. That you're conscientious, and that's, that's the thing. If you said, "Can you do this?" Yes, of course. Number six, the ability to improvise. The same thing. Adapt to change and improvise. And um, so that is also almost a repeat of the other one. But the ability to improvise, though, I think is a trait that's good for any job, whether you work Agreed. for somebody or you have to be able to improvise and, and adapt. What was, what was number seven? And the last was a less risk aversion. Um, and this is a fascinating one because I, they don't, they don't, this is not cat like so when they say less risk aversion it, it goes it gets a little in the weeds here because they claim that the an entrepreneur or an owner of a company doesn't perceive risk the same way someone else does did you get that out of yeah and so um in other words if you said yeah and the example they used if you were a if you were someone who liked to um parachute Skydive, or, yeah. Right, or you were a mountain climber, a mountain climber, scuba diver. For you, that might just be a regular thing. For somebody else, it'd be like, it's oh risky. my gosh, right? It's risky, yeah. So they, you're right. That and your examples are perfect. We can leave it there because how we internalize our perception of risk. So apparently, externally, entrepreneurs have a high level. That they, they're risk averse, but they are risk takers. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. I was at a cocktail party in Rehoboth, and I was, and somebody asked me. The, the question I always, what do you do? Yeah. So. By the way, what are you, how are you answering that these days? Because I do think about it a great little deal. Little as possible. <laughs> Wait, the answer to the question is, as little as possible. No, then they look at me and I said, well, I do a few things. And, mm. and, and, but I said, let's just, uh, marketing. I don't, I don't usually get into, we do this podcast, we have a radio show or internet show. We have an agency. But the the funny thing was, I this guy asked me. He was he's a New Yorker. He was right at me. Boom, 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 boom. That's was, the first one. Was what do you do? Right. He's an attorney. What yeah. do you do? And so I said to him, and I said, you know, but it's always up in the air. You're always looking for the next assignment or the next thing. How long have you been doing it? 
And I said, well, gosh, it's been probably going on 12 or 13 years. Hey, it's a success. <laughs> He just, he just threw his hands back. You know, after five years, if you're still doing what you started doing, you, you, we deem it a success. And I said, yeah. oh, you know, I said, you never know. Bank always, account might not. We're always looking for <laughs> sponsors and we're always looking for, uh, you know, uh, projects to do and people to consult with and whatever. Well, how long have you been doing it? And I said, well, you know, well. You're done. You're on your road. But, and I, I guess, and, and this here too, it says if you do something in that article we just did, if you did it, did it eight years, I was considered long term. Long term. Success. So, so um, that what do you do question, I've been field testing the following. I've been trying to get it down to the elevator pitch of as little stuff as possible. So I was asked this exact same thing at an event, cocktail in hand, name tag. I think I put it on this side. You got to put it on the right. So we shake hands, and and that's so they so when so you, you shake, look at it, yeah. everybody else yeah. had it over here. But I learned from Focus Group and Tim Bennett to put your name right. tag on your your right. So this guy comes up in typical New York. It's New York is what do you do, where do you live, and how much rent do you pay? Yeah. <laughs> Usually, and, and, and salary is somewhere down the line. What do you do? And I said, you know what? I said uh, for most of my professional career, I've been a storyteller. I said it took me a while to realize that. I said, but that's taken the form of. Uh, three successful ad agencies, uh, radio broadcast, a stint at Sirius XM satellite radio, and going back to school for animation. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, I don't know how much people would take that. I'm a storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling you a story right now, right? I think you and I should do, what is that storytelling thing they do now all over the country? Maybe we should do one of those. Like Frank like Wasn't up, isn't Frank it? doing it or Lisa Lamp? And it was, yeah. They were doing like the story thing. Um, could you get up and tell a story? Maybe yeah, I could, but you know, you know what I've been watching a lot of lately? Um, I downloaded the TED app, the TED Talks, and yeah. you are 100% right. They have dropped to yeah. 12 minutes, it went from 13 20, minutes, 20 to 16. 12. It's yeah. odd to have one in the 22 range. But when you watch the TED Talks, you're watching professional storytelling because they have to write, they have to nail that. And, and whether you like it or not, you know right away whether you like the teller of the story. But think about agency work. When you and I walk into a room and we're asking people to spend a million dollars on a campaign, they have to like you. They have to like what you're saying. They have to trust you. I mean, so there's a lot involved in there. Yeah. No. Well, it's, it's, I'll have to come up with my, my elevator pitch. I don't think mine's working if you had the... Well, storyteller, <laughs> I thought, might be a little... Hmm. It's like, I'm a disruptor. I'm an influencer. I'm an influencer. <laughs> I'm you a know, disruptor. I'm taking that critique to the, to the bank. You're 100% right. I think we need, I need to work on that one. I work in marketing. That, that's a far known, that's a known term. I'm an ad guy. I'm an ad guy. I'm oh, ad okay. Guy. Okay, okay. Yeah, there you go. I sell cars. <laughs> you handle Chevy? That's my neighbor. <laughs> I remember Chevy? my neighbor down in South Philly. When, what do you do? I, said, I sell cars. You sell Chevy? No. I'm <laughs> Uber. When, we, were, when uh, we had Volkswagen working with us, every Volkswagen driver that I knew personally would ask me tons of questions. Yeah. When are they doing this? When are they doing that? I'm like, I don't know. I'm don't really know. far down the food chain. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> They're sponsoring the show. Yeah. So the uh, the second shop talk, this one quite quite interesting, and I think many of us have been at either end of this. But the headline was, or the, the question is, we offered somebody a job, and then they had uh, got a bad reference. Should this job offer be pulled? So this came from Inc. Magazine, and someone had submitted this question saying that they offered somebody a job, and it was contingent on a good reference coming back. Now, I thought that was odd that why don't you do that before? From the, so you nailed what I practically wanted to circle in red. The position is permanent and will be subject to a three-month probationary period and reference check. So the probationary period, that's anything. I get that, right. yeah. The reference check w was odd, but they said the reason he didn't want the, or she, we don't know, didn't want the reference check done was because they were still employed and they didn't want their and employer that was to know they were the, looking. that was going to be the reference. And that's the, where they wanted the reference check to come in. And then they, so the person resigns, he goes to the new position, they call the employer, and they get the an, reference check is eh. Yeah. And now they don't know if they can fire the guy or not. What do you think? First... You, you laid this out perfectly, and for anybody listening who's been in an HR capacity or you've dealt with this, I have not heard of this being done. No. I've heard of probationary period, particularly when you hire a firm to do an executive search or something. It's a payment thing. There's probation. But to have someone resign, that job they resign from gives them an eh, not so great reference. Yeah. There's a reason you're leaving. Yeah, I would think so. So the answer they gave was interesting. 
Um, and they first kick it off with what Tim observed. Offers contingent on a reference check can be sticky. You're asking someone to resign from their job while keeping open the possibility that you might yank the offer they're accepting. My advice is stay away, stay away from this practice as much as possible. Do your due diligence, get the reference check done, make the offer, leave it at right. that. Stay away from this company then. Yeah. Because the, the, the other thing, and I haven't been in corporate America in 15 years, but even back then, because of how litigious we are. Yep. You could sue. You could say nothing. So if somebody called for a reference to say, hey, we're calling for a reference on so-and-so, they used to, the person worked for you, all I was allowed to say, or all we did as a corporate policy was, I can give you the dates that he or she were employed. If you weren't going to give a good reference. No, regardless. Oh, so we neither- give any references. Neither positive nor negative. Because, because it puts you on the hook. Wow. So it, wow. it got to the point where it's like, I can confirm, and we couldn't confirm salary. So this came from your legal department. This was from, the, and the HR department says, if someone calls for reference on, you know, Mary Jo, wow. Mary Jo worked here from, you know, June 1998 until April 2015, you know. Flip it around, and a good friend of yours who lives in Chicago, let's say, or, or Oregon or Milwaukee, someone's changing jobs and wants to give you as a personal reference. They can't do you as a professional yeah. one because they didn't have a business dealing with you, but you could easily do a personal yeah. reference. Yeah. But if it's anybody who is connected to the company, you were told from legal. Yeah. And, the, and you're exactly right. That's what you would do. And in those cases, when I had interviewed as well, and they said, you know, I would say I don't want to give you my direct boss or my direct supervisors. I don't want them to know I'm looking. But internally, there's a few people that I've worked with at senior levels that know I'm looking and I'd be happy for them to talk to you. And that usually ends up being fine. But I do think it's it's a it's a crazy a crazy thing that a company would do this because it just it's it's just fraught it, with issues. It feels like it's gonna and, and in fact they continue to say that the company that offered the job contingent on references has a high responsibility to not immediately rescind the offer but to try to get more information. And in fact, that was the recommendation is dig down in it and then approach the candidate and say, We called your reference at your old company. Here's what they said. And then he or she can say, you know what? Uh, that relates to a, job, a project I was on that was out of my purview or was out of my scope of work. You're just, I just think you're putting everybody in a really icky position. Yeah. And if you're savvy, particularly in industries now, I was in the auto industry, so as big as the auto industry is, it was small. Oh, yeah. Particularly in People marketing move around. Yeah. So if there was somebody and I'm like, hmm. So I would dial up. Somebody I knew along the way that probably ran across this person, you know, hey, do you know, you know, Joe Smith? What do you think? Yeah. And um, you end up, I mean, one of the one of the funniest ones for me was I remember the Subaru was um, hell bent on, on getting diversity, bringing diversity in because Jesse Jackson was coming. Rainbow push. Rainbow. I remember the so rainbow. They'd gone yeah. out and hired this kid <laughs> for almost double than every other person in the position that he was going into. I know who you're talking about, too. Yeah. And I was traveling, and I'd come back, and HR was delighted. We've, we've, got, ourself a, we've got ourself a diversity a candidate. It's going on and on and on and on and on. Came from this luxury brand and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it's Latino, da, 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 da. So the guy starts, and I remember, and I just started asking him questions, and he was Arab, <laughs> so it didn't count. <laughs> they... Arab doesn't count as a diverse they hire. They thought because they of thought his he was appearance, Latino. he was Latino. He, right. And I, so I'm like, hola. He's like, he's like, I'm from Lebanon. I know exactly what you're talking about. He ended up being a good guy. A great but, guy. But, but HR trying to check the box, check the box, check the box. And I said, now you've put this kid in a box. I said, you, you've had expectation that he was something he's not. You've way overpaid him for what he's doing. The other people in the department are, are now... Um, angry about the whole anyway on the reference front i will conclude by saying this uh i hate references to begin with for me to rack my brain to find to bother that's the better way of putting it to bother three other professionals to give you know i but you and i may be at a certain point in our career right i now know enough people that you could do that and in fact i was meeting with friends of ours recently and I said to the husband and wife, who I both know professionally, I said, guys, if you ever need a reference, because he asked me for a reference one day and I didn't get back to him in time. And I said, carte blanche, 
just let me know you're sending someone my way and I'll give the reference. Don't even bother asking. And if you ask for a reference, Tim and John's rule, make sure that the person that you are going to be giving the name of knows that you're giving their name. My old uh, assistant, Josh, you know, Greg's nephew, I get a call out of the blue one day and it's someone who's calling for a reference for Josh for this job. And she's like, you know, I, I like him and I have some misgivings. And I'm like, okay, well, here's our experience. I said, he's super good at solving problems. He's this, he's this. I said, you want my advice if you hire him? And I said, you should hire him. Keep him busy. <laughs> and you know what? She followed the advice. She kept him busy. He was very happy for years. All right. <laughs> And then I saw yeah, me. Yeah, we hired him. He was my friend's, uh, my friend's nephew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, folks, uh, we're going to wrap up today. Uh, we want to have a, uh, a big thank you. We want to give a thank you to Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. If you use the code FOCUS and you're at Fiverr.com looking for freelance services, everything from logo design to copywriting to video editing to motion graphics to web design to web coding, Use Focus, you'll get 10% off your first order, and I think you'll have a fun time over there. It's a great site. And a big thanks to Deep Discount. Arr, the shark! Go to focusgroupradio.com, click on the Deep Discount logo, and begin your shopping journey. And remember, things at Deep Discount you're just not going to see on TV or the streaming platforms. Need I say more? You got it. Packaged media, folks. It's here to stay, and we like it. So uh, don't text and drive. Arrive alive, and we'll see you in the new week. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Who do you have to blow to get a drink around here? Who do you have to blow to get a drink around here?